An important feature of the insurance industry is the ability of insurers to resell whole or partial risks to other firms in a process called reinsurance. The first organization to engage in creating this kind of market for insurance companies was Cologne Re back in 1846. The Swiss quickly followed into this particular market uh, by the 1860s and ultimately established a reciprocal pool between their reinsurers to make sure that there was ultimately a safe way to spread the risk that reinsurance companies were beginning to build up. Now, these types of organizations, reinsurance firms, ultimately help smaller insurance companies to absorb larger risks by allowing them to slice off parts of these risks into towers and sell off aspects of it to other firms. So what a reinsurer does ultimately is buy risk exposures uh, or help to provide insurance uh, to insurers to offset these risks and then they repackage the insurance that they've written, selling it off to a number of investors around the world. In today's market, we see a relatively high concentration of reinsurers with Munich Re and Swiss Re holding a roughly 40% of the global market in reinsurance. Now, of course, the major concern is that reinsurance firms do resell these risks to others. And um, that can lead to, in some unusual situations, insurance firms selling off their risks to reinsurers only to have them blended and securitized into a portfolio, which that insurance company subsequently buys back. Another possibility um, is the notion of a chain of insurance risks across a number of firms, uh, which can ultimately result in firms having their own original risks brought back onto their balance sheets. <clears throat> now, in the reinsurance market, one of the particular things we've seen at the end of the 20th, early 21st century uh, is the entrance of pension funds and hedge funds into this particular space. The reason these uh, investors are interested in reinsurance is because they feel that the risks associated with reinsurance don't correlate very heavily with the other assets in their portfolios. And as a result, it provides them the opportunity to invest in an asset class, which helps with their diversification, while at the same time providing them with a regular premium that gets paid out to them. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, insurance companies do fail from time to time. Uh, and when an insurance company fails, typically it's because they've moved into some kind of new line of insurance that they're typically unfamiliar with. Uh, <clears throat> and this means, of course, uh, that they may be underpricing certain kinds of risks uh, that they are clear of the actual distribution of claims will be, uh, will be. This is happening in a couple of areas right now in the 21st century, particularly related to cyber insurance and uh, claims related to uh, climate change. In, 19, uh, in 2019, an underwriter from Lloyd's of London referred to these as evolving risks, implying that the historical data or the historical actuarial rates associated with these risks were in fact not going to be very good guides to the future, suggesting that in firms that had made business in these two particular areas may find themselves paying out much larger claims than initially anticipated which to, in most people's concerns could lead to a failure of an insurance company, much like what happened to AIG in the aftermath of the 2008 panic when it needed to be bailed out by the US government because of the position it took related to credit default swaps. Now, when an insurance company does fail, typically it's the state that needs to step in uh, to try to sort out the mess. However, the state does not uh, only want to get involved with sorting things out, it typically also involves reducing the amount of <laughs> claims that people have on the insurance pool. Now in the United States, this is typically done at the state level rather than at the federal level, which means of course that there are only a certain amount of resources actually available to back up insurance company um, policyholders when the firm itself fails. In 1990, Canadian life insurers decided to try to reinforce the perception of security in their industry by agreeing to create an organization then called CompCorp, but later called Asuris, which would be a nonprofit organization which would transfer life insurance policies from a defaulting organization to other healthy insurers. And this would allow the insured parties to have their claims relatively protected knowing that even if their insurance company failed, that other life insurance companies would ultimately honor these um, <laughs> pledges, at least to the tune of 85% of the contracted benefits. Unfortunately, this came, uh, the need for a service 
uh, came back relatively quickly. <clears throat> uh, by 1993, Confederation Life, one of Canada's largest life insurers, uh, actually required a uh, bailout from Asuras and restructuring, uh, simply because the firm had found itself in an untenable position. So Confederation Life had gotten started back in 1871 and was Canada's second largest life insurer. Uh, ultimately, they had expanded very quickly, both domestically and internationally, by offering a variety of innovative products. For instance, they were the first company in, uh, or in Canada to offer a life insurance contract without requiring people to take, have a medical exam. Uh, but things sort of changed for the worst at Confederation Life back in 1985. The firm made a, a rather fateful decision uh, to buy a trust and to then use the deposits at this trust in order to fund investments. Uh, and the timing couldn't have been worse, because in the late 1980s, interest rates were rising. We actually see prime rate rising in Canada from 9.5% all the way to 14% between 1987 uh, and 1990. And this, of course, meant that the trust's financiers or its depositors demanded higher and higher GIC rates, which required Confederation to honor that in order to be able to bring in the capital that it was looking for. Now, the firm mostly made uh, investments in commercial real estate. Uh, and several of these were internationally located, which of course makes it harder for the firm to monitor their actual value and the state of affairs with a particular property. By 1989, the firm was very heavily leveraged uh, into real estate investments with almost three quarters of its assets being related to real estate. Um, problematically, more than half of its portfolio was related to a single development corporation called Remark. Now, unsurprisingly, uh, this toxic mix of higher required financing rates and firms having to chase higher and higher rates of return in order to meet these obligations uh, typically don't end well. It usually results in firms taking on excessive amounts of risk. And unfortunately, in 1991, after seeing interest rates rise for so many years, the Bank of Canada rapidly cut its benchmark interest rates, which of course <clears throat> uh, put Confederation Life in a rather challenging position. As mortgage rates fell and people refinanced, they were still required to pay out the 12 and 15% rate GICs that had been sold in the late 1980s. By 1991, the firm was taking losses, and by 1993, the firm was actually losing over $100,000 a day. By the time they had time to step in and try to save Confederation Life, what they realized is that as much as 25% of its real estate portfolio was in distress. The board tried to sell off assets in order to raise capital, but no one was interested in the firm's assets or the firm itself. As their credit rating dropped, their costs of financing rose even higher, exacerbating the financial problems and ultimately leading regulators to fear that a <clears throat> uh, failure of the firm could lead to a much wider financial crisis. And so finally, in, on August 11th, 1994, Confederation Life was forced into restructuring by uh, Canadian regulators who ended up splitting up its viable business lines among its competitors with a service ultimately re uh, assuming responsibility for the outstanding life insurance products. <clears throat> Now, in order to help try to safeguard against these kinds of failures in the future, <clears throat> the International Association of Insurance Supervisors was set up that same year uh, by a collection of national regulators to try to help identify and disseminate best practices in both policies uh, and risk management for insurance companies. Today, the IAIS covers 190 jurisdictions, has over 140 countries that participate in it, effectively making it like the Basel Committee on Banking, except for the insurance industry. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the IAIS is not as well developed uh, as the Basel <clears throat> um, Committee is, uh, but nonetheless, it still tries to provide an estimate of the assess uh, of risk so that other insurers are familiar uh, and that consumers are familiar with the, pot, the real risks of default that exist within insurance companies. Ultimately, the goal is to try to help identify firms that are deemed to be too big to fail and to try to focus on making sure that those firms are sufficiently capitalized to absorb the risks that they've taken.